Now, just a moment, young man. Uh-huh. Before you go ahead with this talk, I want you to know... Yes. ...that you had a very interesting letter from Washington, D.C. Is that so? Yes, a fan letter. A boo 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 Yes. <laughs> what did they want to know? Well, they'd like to know something about your love life. Uh-huh. Well... Well, there, 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 there isn't much to say. Oh, there isn't? No, not really. Oh, I see. Then you haven't had a love life. Well, I wouldn't say that either. No. I, I, I get around a little. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't feel that it should be public. Oh, I see. Mm. Uh, was she interested? Yes, this was a very charming girl. Oh, it was? Yes. Well, now that's different. Yes. Uh, what did she say? Well, she wants to know all about you. Yes. yes. Well, is it, uh, it's not triple prattle. Oh, no. It's got to be the real thing, you know. Oh, yes. It's got to be heavy love. Yes. Steady going and like that. Oh, yes. Yes. But aren't you a little bit young to have a sweetheart? Well, of course, I'm not getting any younger. Oh, I <laughs> see. <laughs> no. I was going steady when I was seven years old. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Well. She was only eight, though. I see. She wasn't very sophisticated. I don't suppose so. I don't think it was real love. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Really. No. What about school? Oh, I had lots of sweethearts years. Uh, in zoology class, I met Catherine and Gertrude and uh, Eleanor. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I went steady with all of them, too. Oh, fine. <laughs> you met them all in zoology class? Mm-hmm. I was pretty good in zoology. I should say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Catherine sat in front of me and Eleanor sat in back of me. Oh, what fun, what fun. Yeah. What laugh. Yeah. But at the end of the year, did you know anything about zoology? Well, not as much as I knew about Catherine and Gertrude. No. <laughs> no. Well, now, tell me about this Catherine. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I, uh, I gave her my pin. Oh, your pin. Mm-hmm. I see. Yes. What fraternity? Uh, Boy Scout pin. Oh, Boy Scout pin. <laughs> well, then it was serious. Oh, it was, sure. Yes. You were as good as married. No, no, I, I was better than married. Oh, you were? Yes. <laughs> well, I couldn't have been worse than married. No, no. Well, no, no. oh, but that's all over now. Well, what was the matter? What brought this love boat on the rocks? Well, I guess I was too good to her. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I took her to the park, you see, and the zoo, and bought her candy and gum, and cracker jack. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Two boxes, two boxes. None of this dizzy up stuff. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And uh, she she got the best prize. The best prize? Yes. Darn it. I see. <laughs> so then going home one night, I said, uh, let's hold hands, see? Hold hands. Mm-hmm. What do you think she said? What did she say? She said, no. No? Boy, did I burn up. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> After all the money I'd spent, too. Yes. Well, don't you think it was a little out of order, insisting on holding hands? Well, maybe it was. But I'm a wild sort of fella, you know. Yes. <laughs> you who? All right. <laughs> it's the gypsy in me. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Hey there, I'm Mike Gillette, your host, and this is When Radio Ruled, episode number 26, Charlie McCarthy, Ladies' Man, 1937. Charlie McCarthy was made of wood and less than three feet tall, but Charlie was still the biggest star of 1937. Isn't he dumb, Mary? I'll say, he's a regular Charlie McCarthy with blood. (laughs) Congratulations! Congratulations. Yes, sir, that's the best description yet. (laughs) And how? (laughs) Against all odds, Charlie McCarthy and his ventriloquist, Edgar Bergen, got their own radio show and shot right to number one in the ratings. It wasn't even close. Charlie's personality was the key. Impetuous man-child, naive and worldly, Charlie fancied himself a ladies' man, relentlessly pursuing his female guest stars. Too young to drink, so Charlie slyly offered lemonade to his intended conquests. And more often than not, the ladies slyly accepted. This podcast is about Charlie McCarthy, Sexiest Man Alive, 1937, and the famous women in his life.
Charlie McCarthy established early on that the ladies found him irresistible, and his guest stars were more than happy to play along. And what guest stars? The Charlie McCarthy Show was the most popular show on the most popular media in America. A-list celebrities and really big stars all wanted to get a guest shot on Charlie McCarthy. Big stars, like Clark Gable. When this show was recorded, Clark Gable hadn't yet reached the peak of his fame. Gone with the Wind was still two years away, but Gable was already a big movie star, having been nominated twice for the Best Actor Oscar and winning once. And Clark Gable was a bona fide sex symbol, just like Charlie McCarthy. From October 17, 1937, Charlie competes with Clark Gable for a date with Dorothy L'Amour. Ah, Gable, what an actor, what a hero, what a man. Huh? You're right, Charlie. Huh? Yes, there's one man who deserves his reputation. He's handsome, talented, he's suave, and a real man's man. Oh, let's not talk about me. Let's talk about Gable. <laughs> <laughs> I am talking about Gable, Charlie. Yeah. Yes, and it's well for you to watch him, for there's much to learn. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't like to have this get around, you know. But Gable knows McCarthy's in town. He does. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine he's quite concerned. Well, now, this is strictly confidential. Yes. But uh, Gable called me up the other day, and he asked me to take it a little easy out here in Hollywood. Oh, he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> take it easy. Yes. Yeah. You know, friendly rivalry. <laughs> uh, yes, I know. And what was the outcome? Well, I promised him I wouldn't wear a turtleneck sweater. And uh, he promised me he wouldn't wear a monocle. Oh, I see. Is that the truth, Charlie? I, well, I see. Is that the truth? Well, I, I told you. I, is it the truth? Uh, we, uh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good line. Yeah. Well, I see. Uh, would, would you like to meet Clark Gable, Charlie? Yes, I would. But don't repeat what I said, sir. No, don't repeat. No. Don't be a cab. No, I don't. Uh, oh, Clark, uh, my little friend Charlie McCarthy wants to meet you. Well, then I've always wanted to meet him. Well, so you're Charlie McCarthy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you're Clark Gable. Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm Edgar Bergen. So, so what? <laughs> You know, Mr. Gable, I've written a poem about you. You have, Charlie. It mm. should be good. It should be, but will it? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will. Well, here's his. When girls are born, they start to talk as soon as they are able. And the first three words they ever say are Mama, Papa, Gable. Okay, <laughs> 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 that, that's quite flattering, Johnny. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Now, I'll try to return the compliment in rhyme. Claudette, Carol, Sonia, Madge, Miriam, Joan, and Dorothy. What's the difference? What the name? They all love McCarthy. Yes, McCarthy. <laughs> <laughs> you strained yourself a little there, I think. <laughs> well, what did Keats' jelly have that we haven't got? Well, rhymes for one thing. <laughs> you know, Jolly, we should be great friends. Yeah, we should. Even though we are competitors, sir. <laughs> competitors? Well, yes, yes. Why, Charlie, I couldn't hope to compete with such a great lover as you. No? Well, that's true. I am, uh, oh, of course not. Uh, well, now, what I mean is I... Uh, yes, 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 I know what you mean. Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> well, I'll have to be more careful next time. <laughs> well, no, frankly, Charlie, I admire you. Uh-huh. You, you admire me? Yes. Oh, I, I really, I'm not so much. Well, uh, there's something about you. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> well, you really couldn't call me very handsome, could you? No, no, I couldn't. But I, I mean, uh, yeah, well, well, of course, uh, uh, no, I mean, you... Uh, yeah, uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll have to watch myself from now on. <laughs> no, but strictly, between us, Charlie, to what do you attribute your great success as a Casanova? Will you tell me? Well, now, I really... I, oh, I, come on, Charlie. Oh, I don't come on. know. Come on, you can be frank with me. Yes, I know, but does Gobble tell Dietrich? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll 
Don't keep it a secret, Charlie. Uh-huh. I'll tell you what I'll do. If you tell me your system, I'll tell you mine. Of course, I'm giving more than I'm getting here. <laughs> but I'm so generous. Yes, yes, of course. But, uh, but what about the McCarthy system? Well, I don't know how I do it, really. But I sweep them off their feet. It's love at first sweep. <laughs> I don't approve of those tactics, Charlie. In my opinion... Please don't interrupt, Bergen. You're listening to experts. I see. It. Well, is that the complete McCarthy system, Charlie? That's all, so help me. Mm. Oh, sounds very simple. But effective. Yeah. Now, how do you operate? <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie, now, my method is uh, it's quieter. Dinner invitations and romantic speeches. Uh huh. You may be right, Clark, but I've always oh, found. Where have it. you found Bergen? Pay no attention to Bergen, Mister Gable. He's so naive. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to seem critical, Charlie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I still, I still say personality is the answer. Now I'll call Dorothy Lamour over, and when, and when I smile in her eyes, watch her swoon. Yes. <laughs> yes, you do that, Charlie, and I'll show you how I take her away from you, gentlemen. Uh, is this a private contest? Why, no. Have you anything to contribute, Mr. Eddy? Yes, I have. You, you, you've forgotten the most important of all systems. Huh? A song is the way to a woman's heart. All right, Nelson. We'll give you a chance to prove it. Well, now, fellows, I'll show you the difference between winning a girl and making a fool of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dottie. Yes, Charlie? Mr. Eddy has something to say to you. Dorothy, do, do you enjoy the old love songs? Yes, I do, Nelson. I think they're beautiful. Well, I... I have only this to say. Just a song at twilight when the lights are alone. Mm, that's very lovely, Nelson. But don't strain your voice. Oh, uh, may I may may I sing the rest of it to you when we when we go out this evening? I'm sorry, Nelson, not this evening. Uh, what do you do for an encore, Nelson? Why don't you mail her a copy of the song? <laughs> <laughs> All right, batter up, Mister Gable. Next, <laughs> Dorothy. Your eyes are alight with the dark beauty of the ages. Thank you, Clark. You walk like a goddess. Come down amongst men. Thank you, Clark. Will you join me for dinner tonight? No, thank you, Clark. Not this evening. <laughs> the score is nothing to nothing. <laughs> and it's the last half of the night. Home run the coffee coming up. <laughs> Dottie, darling. Uh, yes, Charlie, dear. Now, tell the gentleman why you wouldn't go out with him this evening. Because I have a date, Charlie, darling. <laughs> with Edgar Bergen. Wow. <laughs> Just as A-list movie stars wanted to appear with Charlie McCarthy, A-list athletes also wanted a chance to present themselves to the tens of millions of Americans listening in. A-list athletes, like tennis great Alice Marble, the kind of athlete that captured the attention of the whole world. Alice Marble was a gifted natural athlete who had upended women's amateur tennis with her powerful serve and devastatingly aggressive neck game. She also shocked the sensibilities of polite society by playing tennis in shorts instead of the traditional skirts. When Alice Marble appeared on Charlie's show, she had just returned to tennis after two years of forced retirement due to a life-threatening illness. When this show was broadcast, Alice had once again captured the number one in the world rankings by her dominating wins in the women's single and doubles championships at the U.S. Nationals in 1936. From April 29, 1937, Charlie flirts with tennis champ Alice Marble. Miss Marble, as a sort of a dabbler in the art of slapping a ball over and into the net, I'd like to ask you something more or less personal. What's that, Mr. Bergen? Uh, what are you doing tonight, Mr. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, do you think that women are as good sports and as good losers or winners as men are? I think so. I know the best loved person in all tennis is Helen Jacobs, on account of her splendid sportsmanship and courage. That was one reason why winning the championship from her last summer was not as pleasant as it might have been. I think Miss Tennant will agree with me on that. Yes, I will. Helen is a very fine girl. Well, we all can't win. <laughs> oh, what a philosopher. What a philosopher. 
Marble. <laughs> uh, Miss Marble. Charlie, please. Yes, Martha. Charlie. Uh, what are you doing tonight? Uh, <laughs> Alice is training, Charlie. She goes to bed every night at 10 o'clock. Oh, that's too bad. I thought she might like to see a show or something else. That will do, Charlie. That will do. What are you talking about, Bergen? I bet you had the same idea yourself. <laughs> I must apologize for him, Miss Marble. By the way, are you uh, in love? Mm-hmm. Yes, with tennis. Oh. <laughs> you see... Alice really hasn't time to be in love just now. She's concentrating on winning that Wimbledon championship in June. Mm-hmm. And as an expert, Miss Tennant, what do you think of her chances? I think they're very good. <clears throat> of course, the tournament is full of crack players like Madame Sperling, uh, Matthew of France, Helen Jacobs. But ha- Alice has a couple of advantages over them all. And what are they? Well, for one thing, she has the best footwork any woman ever had. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and for another, she's the only woman who ever played who had top spin on her serve. Top spin? What's that? <laughs> it makes the ball bounce clearly. Bounce clearly? Did you ever see a Bergen's check? Wait a minute. <laughs> Young man, I'm really going to have to speak to you in a moment. Miss Marble, uh, where did you get that top spin from? Teachers, we call her. Helped bring it out. But I guess I was just lucky enough to be born with it. Mm-hmm. There was another thing that helped, though. And what was that? Well, you see, when I was young, I was a regular tomboy. I played baseball with boys all my life, and that helped strengthen the muscles in my arm. You know, I was mascot of the San Francisco Seals baseball team for three years. I heard something about it. It's true, and when I won the championship last summer, Lefty O'Doul, the SEALs manager, sent me a telegram. What did he say? He said, always knew a swell left fielder would make a chance. (laughs) Well, I was a bit of a shortstop myself in the old days. Um, However, coming back to the original subject, Miss Marble, uh, what can I do for you, Charlie? Uh, Would you sort of uh, like to go out tonight, say, until quarter past ten? Charlie, please. Uh What the heck? You can't blame a guy for trying. (laughs) I'm very sorry for the way Charlie has behaved tonight, ladies, and I do want to thank you for coming up here. Oh, that's perfectly all right, Mr. Bergen. We didn't mind. We didn't mind him a bit. Uh, You couldn't make it tonight, could you, Miss Marvel? Until about five after, say? Please, Mr. McCarthy, remember my amateur standing. Not tonight, tomorrow night, or any other night. Well, I guess that clears that up. (laughs) It wasn't just a one-way street with Charlie. The ladies also flirted with him. After all, an entire country adored Charlie McCarthy for his boyish charm. Why wouldn't actresses, models, athletes, and other beautiful and accomplished women be affected the same way? In the world of the Chase and Sanborn Hour, Dorothy L'Amour would take on the role of Charlie's long-suffering girlfriend. Playboy McCarthy did care for Dorothy. But he had a wandering eye, and Dorothy had to work to hold Charlie's interest. Dorothy L'Amour's film career had just begun when she was cast in the Chase and Sanborn Hour Charlie McCarthy show. A big band singer turned starlet, at this point in her career only having made two films, both as a South Pacific sarong-wearing native girl. After the Charlie McCarthy show helped to make Dorothy L'Amour's name a household word, She would go on to her greatest fame as the female in the Bob Hope Bing Crosby love triangles in most of their incredibly popular road films. From May 9, 1937. Dorothy L'Amour, Hollywood's newest star. Beautiful, versatile, glamorous. Yes, and in addition to that, she's not bad. She's not half bad, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Thank you, Charlie. You're very cute. You're trying to cute yourself. Now, considering that we're going to be working together, I think we ought to be good friends, don't you? Yes, Charlie, we all ought to be good friends, but... uh... Now, don't cramp my style, M.E.J. I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Lamour. Yes, Charlie. uh, Would you like... uh, Would you care... um... How about a lemonade or something? Now, 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 Charlie, please postpone your lemonade invitation till later, will you? All right. I bow to Art, but I defer to Dorothy. Curtsy. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> curtsy. As a result of one curtsy to another, Dorothy Lamour sings What Will I Tell My Heart. Thank you, Dorothy. That was lovely. Yes, lovely. Lovely, Miss Lamour. It was really. <laughs> it was really lovely. Tell me, is there a lull in your life? 
Well, not really, Charlie. Then you don't know what it means to be lonely, huh? Are you lonely, Charlie? All day I have nothing to do. At night I just walked and walked and home to my empty room. Oh, you poor darling. Oh. No. My dear little diary. Filled with nothing but empty pages. All those blankety blank blank pages. <laughs> Charlie, you're breaking my heart. <sighs> Every night the same thing. Nothing ever happens. Oh, Miss Lamore. How about having dinner with me some night? Oh, wonderful. Any night, Miss Lamore. Any night, Paul. All right, then, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow? No go. May West is penciled in for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, you certainly get a lot of fun out of being the world's greatest imaginary Romeo. Carol Lombard was the highest paid film star of 1937 and one of the most iconic blonde bombshells of all time. A supporting juvenile actress in silent films, when the talkies took over, Carol graduated to become a romantic lead and the queen of screwball comedies demanding an astronomical $450,000 a year and worth every penny. A true sex symbol, once married to William Powell and now dating Clark Gable, Carol proved to be too much woman for Charlie when he put the moves on Carol Lombard, May 16, 1937. Bam, bam, bam. Bells ring. Everything happens, but I haven't spoken to Carol Lombard yet. Something must be done, Mr. Amici. Oh, now, Charlie, listen. Carol Lombard wouldn't speak to you. Well, why, she's dated the best man in Hollywood. Why, she hasn't met the best man in Hollywood yet. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, then, Charlie. Uh, Miss Lombard. Uh, woo -woo. Please. Miss Lombard, this is Charlie McCarthy. Oh, Charlie, at last we meet. Oh, Miss Lombard. I have so much to tell you. Oh, Charlie... Oh, Carol. <laughs> if I wouldn't be intruding... Yeah, but you would be. I should. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, and you scram too, Amici. <laughs> Morning. Have it your own way, yeah. Charlie. At last, Carol, we're alone. So long I've wanted to tell you how beautiful you are. How charming and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> You're not just saying that, are you? Oh, believe me, I swear by the stars above. Your smile, it's like a rose wet with the morning dew. Oh, then you do love me. Yeah. Say that you do. Tell me that you huh? love me. Well, well what, I, what I meant to say was that, uh, that you and I, that the both of us... Uh, oh, Charlie, uh, from the first time I heard your voice, I fell madly in love with you. Is that so? <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it, it, it's nice. It's nice to be friends, isn't it? Friends? <laughs> oh, this is love, really, uh, real love. Well, it's... Undying love. You do love me. Oh, Jesus. Well, I was... Uh, uh, well, 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 now, let's be sensible about this. Thing. Oh, but you do love me. Well, well, what I had in mind was a lemonade when I... <laughs> Lemonade? Oh, how can I think of that with you so near? And yeah? the passionate, burning love I have oh, for you. Yeah. You poor thing. How she loves me. <laughs> oh, you'll meet someone else. No, there can never be another. I must have you. Oh, let me hold no, you. No, no, Crush no, no, you. No, 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 no. Without you, I die. Yeah, I shall follow yeah, you to the yeah, end of the world yeah, and we'll scream see. out my love yeah, for you. Wait a minute, Charlie. Yeah, wait a minute. Oh, my. Oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Janichi. Help. Help. <laughs> And now, for a change of pace, here's Charlie wooing his steady girl musically in a delightful duet with Dorothy L'Amour singing, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. Things have come to a pretty pass, our romance is growing flat. For you like this and the other, while I go for this and that. Goodness knows what the end will be. Oh, I don't know where I'm at. It looks as if we two will never be one. Something must be done. You say either, 
And I say either, you say neither, and I say neither, either, either, neither, neither. Let's call the whole thing off. You like potato, and I like potato. You say tomato, and I say tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing off. But oh, if we call the whole thing off, then we must part. And oh, if we ever part, then that might break my heart. So if you like pajamas, and I like pajamas, I'll wear pajamas and give up pajamas. For we know we need each other, so we better call the calling off on. Let's call the whole thing off. Miss Lamour, that song was lovely. Trey, lovely. Only you can sing it just right, my pretty one. Thank you, but really, Charlie, I've heard you say that before. Ah, uh, had I told you how frightfully lonely I was all alone in Hollywood? Yes, you did. Uh, and then I suppose comes the lemonade. I was coming to that, yes. Uh, you don't like lemonade? Oh, sure. But not with you. Oh, the girl is out of her mind. She spurns me. <laughs> Rather cool this evening, don't you think, Miss Lamore? Yes, there's a frost, if you can get it. Oh, I get it, yes. I get it all. Right. But why this attitude? Just because of my few platonic friendships like Carol and May and Joan? Oh, I've heard all about you. Mm. You're Casanova McCarthy, the heartbreaker of Hollywood. I guess it's the gypsy in me. <laughs> if I wasn't so darn good looking, you know. Charlie, this is the end. You mean we've, uh... Our flaming romance is but a bunch of clinkers? Yes, Charlie. Let's call the whole thing off. Oh. I say laughter. And I say laughter. You say after. But you say after. Laughter. Laughter. After. After. Let's call the whole thing off. I like vanilla. And I like vanilla. You say sparilla. But you say sparilla. Vanilla. Vanilla. Sesprella. Rosa. Let's call the whole thing off. But oh, if we call the whole thing off, then we must part. And oh, if we ever part, then that might break my heart. So if I go for oysters, well, I go for oysters. Well, I still want oysters. Throw away my oysters. For we know we need each other, so we better call the calling off. Oh, let's, let's call, call the whole thing off. off. Mary Boland was a huge Broadway star and a very successful film actress. Having started in silent films and working constantly in the movies since then. When this show was broadcast, Mary Boland had already appeared in 35 films. The character Mary Boland usually played was a pixelated motherly type. Charlie being a little boy, Mary Boland presented both comic and Oedipal possibilities. From May 23, 1937, Charlie McCarthy chats up Mary Boland. Bum, bum, bum. Are you listening, Mother? <laughs> oh, the tintinabulation of those bells, bells, bells. Oh, hello, Miss Boland. I'm Charlie McCarthy. <gasps> Not Casanova McCarthy of Hollywood. That's very strange. I think Casanova was quite a mother, don't you? Yeah. Although he really wasn't as great a musician as Nero, was he? Well, uh, well, Werner Jansen is quite that. Uh, yes, yes, he is. Oh, I love the way he conducts. I just adore yeah. it. He absolutely terrifies me. Um, I wonder what, what would happen if he pointed at the wrong instrument. Uh, that would be most unfortunate. Oh, what were you saying, young man? Oh, well, that was so long ago, I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Charlie McCarthy, the Casanova of Hollywood. Mm. That's such a cute name. Are you Spanish, not McCarthy? They call me Don Juan McCarthy. Uh, Don Juan. That's right. Mm. Don Juan and three to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they do. How interesting. I can see why they might say that. That look in your eye. Oh, you've noticed it too, huh? Oh, why was I cursed with this fatal charm? Uh, your, uh, your left eye looks the most Spanish. Mm. The pupil's darker. Yes, a week ago they were both Spanish. <laughs> And closed. <laughs> Are you an osteopath, Master McCarthy? No, those guys rub me the wrong way. I'm not a chiropractor either. Oh, a chiropractor, how nice. You know, I've often 
wondered what the chiropractor thinks about. What do you think about, Master McCarthy? Well, right now I'm beginning to think I like W.C. Fields. <laughs> oh, you mean Willie? Willie? Uncle Willie? Yeah. Oh, he's such a charming man. Such savoir faire. Such boys. Such, um, uh, um what shall I say? What, uh, um, such a nose. Uh, <laughs> Honest, if he painted green stripes on it, it would look like an awning. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, now that you bring it up. <laughs> Uncle Willie has quite a nose, hasn't he? Uh, would you call it Roman or uh, not? I did call it Redwood. <laughs> That's what got me in trouble. I must introduce you to Willie. You two will get along so well together. I'm not so sure. Oh, not such a choice. Remember my motto. She who hesitates is lost. Yeah, well, I'm not lost. I'm ruined. <laughs> oh, uh, Charlie, I'll call you when Mr. Fields wants to see you. You mean I should wait here until uh, Mr. Fields wants to see me? Uh, yes, yes, Charlie, yeah. yes. <laughs> Silver threads among the gold. <laughs> Charlie McCarthy certainly had the gift of gab. Charlie could charm women of all ages and types, even tough dames, like Mae Robeson. Mae Robeson was 79 years old when she appeared on The Charlie McCarthy Show. She was a film veteran of 45 movies going all the way back to 1908. Before film, Mae Robeson was known as the Grand Old Lady of the American Stage, having first appeared professionally on stage in 1883. Despite the years, longtime showbiz legend Mae Robeson was still at the peak of her powers when she traded witticisms with brand new big star Charlie McCarthy. Mae Robeson was still quick-witted, down-to-earth, fluent in both comedy and drama, tough as nails, and more than a match for Charlie McCarthy. Bum, 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 here we are. There are fairies in the bottom of my swimming pool. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Robeson. Hello, how are you, Charlie? Oh, I'm fine. I want, I want to tell you how wonderful I think you are. That finesse of your performance. Your savoir fair, that trait, trait, tremendous. <laughs> but definitely, too. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, young man. And I consider it a great compliment. You're a mighty fine little lad. And you have the makings of a great man. Well, that's what I told Bergen. Eh? <laughs> but he said I should study. Eh? Ah, Mr. Bergen is right, my son. Mother. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you must study and share the thoughts of great minds. Nothing is more profitable than spending an evening with a good book. Yes, well, I don't know. You see, I have two ducats for the fight tonight. I suppose that's wrong, isn't it? I, of course it's wrong. It's very wrong. Why don't you wait until Tuesday night and see a good scrap? Oh. <laughs> yes. But you don't understand. Tonight, the Pomona assassin headlines the evening event. He's a killer. Oh, don't tell me about that, Tomata. Hmm? He's a sucker for a left hook with that last draw. Oh. Why, that palooka couldn't last two round shadow streak. <laughs> oh, now, come, come, come. That's just where you're wrong, sister. That baby packed a lethal wallop in both of those meat hooks of his. Why, he'll go the distance and he'll win tonight. You well, I've got a buck says he winds up with resin in his teeth before the third scratch. You're talking pin money, babe. Pin money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'll call you. And if Pomona Assassin doesn't KO Tony McSnur, seal his lamps, and trim his wick, I'll pay off with the best spot in town tonight. The hottest spot in town. Uh-huh. You're on. All right, sonny boy. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute now. Name the spot. Well, have you heard stuffed fish down at the broken door? <laughs> that boy scratches a mean hunk of fiddle. Oh, you call that hot? Yeah. <laughs> Give me blubber mouth Zambo. Now, there's a cat who's really mellow. Yeah? Does does he really give out with a la-di-da, la-di-da? Oh, oh, sure. That went out with the cakewalk. Huh? Blubber gives out the ho de do and a ho de do Catch it, catch and arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got something there, Mom. <laughs> Can you truck, Grandma? <laughs> truck? What's the matter with you? You think I'm getting old? Say, huh? how about the Susie Q? Woody! The studying's all for tonight. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Charlie. Huh? Perhaps we shouldn't do this. I'm worried. Oh, don't worry, Muzzy May. Don't worry. 
I'll see that you get home safe by, uh, with me tonight, you know. La-di-da, la-di-da. Let's get me Sonia Henney was only 25 and just beginning her movie career when she appeared on the radio with Charlie McCarthy, June 27, 1937. But acting was her second career. Over the previous 10 years, she had established herself as the greatest figure skater of all time. Sonia Henney had dominated the sport, 10 consecutive years winning the World Figure Skating Championship, gold medals in the Olympics of 1928, 1932, and 1936. She was beautiful, foreign, gifted, confident, and famous all over the world. Sonia Henney's first movie, One in a Million, had opened a critical raids and very successful box office. Charlie McCarthy certainly wanted to get to know Sonia Henney better. Oh, Mr. Amici. Oh, Mr. Amici. Yes, Charlie. Uh, I wouldst a word with thee. What wouldst, Sir Charles? I wouldst a knockdown to yon knockout, Milady Sonia. Oh, but certainly. No sooner said than done ya. Oh, what fun ya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, will you introduce Bergen, too? I'm big-hearted. I don't care. Miss Henny, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. How do you do? Yes, Miss Henny, it's a great pleasure to meet you. You know I'm of Swedish descent. Uh, we're practically neighbors, you know. And the first time I saw you skate was in Norway. Interesting. Mm. Have you been to Oslo, Mr. Bergen? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, I was in Oslo, Jutteboy, Chippenham, oh, Stockholm. Nej, vad morsom. Det är daily land, inte sant? Ja, det är vackert. Ja, 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 ja,
Well, I was, yes. Why should I lie to you? My head was covered with curls and my face was covered with mud. I didn't care. Ishkabibble, I used to say. <laughs> you have a wonderful memory, Charlie. Mm-hmm. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes, it was. Yes, I remember when I played uh, N-Man on the Gas House Croquet Team. That was a wicked game back in 1800 and... Um, <laughs> as far back as that, Charlie? Yes, maybe more. Yes, I remember you used to stop the croquet game to go and kill Indians on 42nd Street. They used to hide in the subway, the little rascals. <laughs> I didn't know the meaning of the word fear then. I'd stick my head around the corner and I'd say, 23 skidoo, and then I'd run. <laughs> Hold on to my scalp, please. Yes, Charlie, I remember it used to frighten me terribly, too. Yes, I... you remember? Where, when was that? Well, back in 1800 and um from... Oh, it was, huh? What were you doing in New York in 1800 and after time? Well, I was singing songs with those slides while you were killing Indians. Oh, oh those gay 90s. You said it. I love my wife, but oh, you kid. Ah, <laughs> uh, those were the days. Ah, uh, those were the days, and you can have them, too. <laughs> Zazu Pitts was a singular comedy town internationally famous, starting when she worked for Mary Pickford in silent film, right up to 1937, and her comedy work for Hal Roach as one half of a popular comedy team with Thelma Toth. In the silent films, Zazu played both comic and dramatic roles to rave reviews. Eric von Stroheim always said she was one of the very best dramatic actors he had ever directed. After Zazu began working in the talkies, she focused on comedy. Her gangly frame, wavering voice, and bulging eyes made her instantly recognizable as the inspiration for Olive Oil and the Max Flesher cartoons. On July 4, 1937, Zazu Pitts appeared with Charlie McCarthy. They discussed the nature of love and whether or not Edgar Bergen was marriage material. My, my, oh, my, my. Trouble, 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 trouble. Life is earnest, but oh, so sad. Uh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Why, what's the matter, Charlie? You sound as if you'd lost your best friend. Oh, it's not me I'm thinking about now. This time it's a change. It's I'm thinking about Miss Pitt. Oh, poor little Miss Hopper, my son. Wasn't that sad? She couldn't even get the man who wore the 14 and a half shirt. Oh, that's sad. Oh, Charlie, I think you're wonderful. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? A love. Oh. Life for me is nothing but unrequited love. What again? Mm. Oh, poor sister. Say, but I know a man who's just crazy about you. Oh, dear me. Is he alive? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, sometimes I wonder, have you met Mr. Bergen? Well, there is a very lonesome man. I can understand that. Yeah. I happen to know that he likes you. You could make him very happy, but he's so timid, you know. You have to be very forward. Oh, I couldn't do that. I'm too backward to be forward. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, Miss Pitts, he really is in love with you. He's nuts about you. Go ahead now. Fess up, Bergen. Now, what do you mean? <laughs> In love, too timid. What is this? I knew it wouldn't work. I never have any luck. Oh, Mr. Bergen, are you going to stand there and deny that you weren't reading love lyrics last night? Well, I was, yes. Oh, how I enjoy poetry. I have written poetry. Uh Uh-oh. Some of it even rhymes. Yeah. (laughs) It's called To a Lover and His Sweetheart. That ought to be good, yeah. Oh, you two are both so one-ish, like a double, yet a single. There is duo, still it's one-o, like a vision in a dream. (laughs) Think you got something there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, just what in heaven's name is that? It isn't much good. It's free birth. Free, you wouldn't be able to give it away. (laughs) Tell her about the one you wrote, Mr. Bergen. It's just about as good. <laughs> no, no, really. Oh, come on. No, it's just a silly... Oh, come on now. Come, come. No, no I'd rather not. Oh, come, come now. Come, come. <laughs> You wanted the coat? No. All right, then. It was just a simple little thing. Oh, that's clear to see. Yes. Um, your hair is like the clouds in a storm-tossed sky. See, that's my... The blue of the Pacific is in your eye. That's the left one, you know, the good one. <laughs> oh, isn't that sentimental? Yes. You can have your kingdom, your dukes and earls, but give me your teeth. They're just like pearls. 
Boy, oh boy, that's really dynamite there. <laughs> Take him out and show him. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> huh? There's more. It gets worse as it goes on. <laughs> Your lips are like petals of a hothouse bicycle. All right. <laughs> Well, that gives you a fair idea how Bergen writes. Now, don't you think Zazu would make someone a very sweet wife? Oh, I certainly do. See? Mm. See? Well, then what are you waiting for? There you are. Now, let me set the wedding date. Wait a minute here. Oh, my. This is so sudden. What's the matter? What kind of a man do you want? Well, I think he should be rather, sort of, kind of, in a way. Well, well that's Bergen. That's Bergen. <laughs> you can't describe him. That's Bergen. <laughs> Well, and, well, have you ever known real love, Zazu? You know, real love? Mm. Well, in a way, I... Now, don't beat around the bush. Come clean now. <laughs> don't you believe marriage is a wonderful thing? Oh, you? indeed I do. Mm-hmm. I think love is just lovely and so romantic. Isn't that ducky? You... <laughs> yes, and she bakes a mean hunk of donut bergen, too. Oh, yeah. How about it, Zazu? It's not that I couldn't be very happy with Mr. Bergen, but... Well, then, what more do you want? Oh, well... I don't think my husband would like it. Yeah. Wow. So, by the way, how is he, Zazel? Yeah, how... Hey, wait a minute. Is Dan Cupid? I'm stupid. Truly, <laughs> I'm just requited love. <laughs> uh-huh. Bruna Castagna was one of the great opera stars of all time. Bruna was Italian, raised in a great musical family. Bruna had been a fixture on the Italian stages from 1925 to 1934 when she moved to America to star for the Metropolitan and the San Francisco operas. Bruna's Metropolitan Opera debut was a smash hit. She quickly became a major recording star in America and the toast of the town in New York. Bruna's crossover appeal and the obvious comic contrast of this tasteful, classy star with the less classy vagabond, Charlie McCarthy, made her a natural guest star for Charlie's show on August 15, 1937. There's a young man here who is very anxious to meet you. Madame Castagna, this is your ardent admirer, Charlie McCarthy. Oh, hello. You are so cute. <laughs> oh, I don't deserve to be so handsome. <laughs> oh, Miss Castagna, I want you to meet my associate, Edgar Bergen. How do you do? Yeah, Miss Castagna, it, this has been a real pleasure to hear you sing this evening. I remember very well when I heard you in Milan. Oh, yes. Were you at La Scala di Milano? Yes, and that was the important event of my visit in Italy. That and the Colosseum. Yeah, I remember the Colosseum. We did four a day there. <laughs> <laughs> Worked like dogs. Yeah. No, Charlie, that's the Colosseum in London. Oh, oh, is it there now? No, no. <laughs> the Colosseum in London has always been there. Oh, I misunderstood you. I thought you said it was in Rome. Oh, well, now, all right, all right, all right. Oh, Miss Castagna, I-, I heard you sing Thursday night in the Hollywood Bowl. It was splendid. It was terrific. Tremendous. It was Coliseum. Oh, we're well, back to that again. <laughs> oh, thank you. I enjoy it, singing under the stars. Yes. Such a lovely audience. Too. Yes, they are nice, aren't they? I sang at the bowl two weeks ago. Did you really? Yes. You sang at the Hollywood Bowl? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It was a community singing. <laughs> <laughs> I even did a solo. Oh. A solo in a community scene? Yes. Oh, no, it does not sound right. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't. (laughs) All the others finished together, but you know how I am. Once I get started, there's no stopping me. I'm so emotional. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Uh, Let me hear you sing, Charlie. No, no, please. Oh, yes, go ahead. Oh, not here, no. Oh, yes, I want to hear you sing. Well, if you coax me, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, let me hear you sing. Yes. All right, I... All right, I will. Oh, I'm just putty in your hands. <laughs> no, Ray, I don't say this is perfect, no. Do, re, mi, fa, so, lo, no. I think I broke it. <laughs> I'm, I'm at that awkward age, you know. My voice is changing. I just... <laughs> uh, well, try this. All right. 
Oh. Ah, well, now that's all right, too. <laughs> yes. No, no, Charlie, you were flaked. Yeah? Well, I wasn't more than a half a note off, was I? Oh, a half a note is enough. Well, that's what you got. What are you complaining about? Miss <laughs> <laughs> huh? Castagna, frankly, what do you think of Charlie's voice? Well, Mr. Amici, I have heard lots of singing, but mm. never anything tanto male. Oh. Yeah, he's really yeah. sound to Molly, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, now yeah, break it yeah. <laughs> Did she say my voice was uncanny? Mm. <laughs> well, not exactly, Charlie. No, now come on out with it, Amici. What did she say about my voice now? Well, if you must know, she said you sing like a dog. Oh, <laughs> uh, like a dog? <laughs> Oh, well, maybe she's right, you. Uh, are you going to sing again? You are, aren't you, Miss Castagna? Or may I call you Bruno? <laughs> Why, <laughs> of course. Oh, yes. Darling. Yes. Oh. Soon I shall have the pleasure of singing the Gypsy song from the opera Carmen. Oh, what luck, what luck, Carmen. That's the old plantation song my uncle used to sing down south. <laughs> <laughs> Carmen, down south? Yes, of course. Don't you remember... Eyes common, eyes common. <laughs> When Glenda Farrell appeared with Charlie McCarthy on August 22, 1937, she was only 33 years old, but already a veteran of over 50 films. Glenda was currently enjoying her greatest success with the recently released Smart Blonde, the first of several Torchy Blaine murder mysteries starring Glenda Farrell. Torchy Blaine was a hard-boiled, quick-witted newspaper reporter with a nose for crime. Glenda Farrell was a no-nonsense blonde beauty, gifted with great comic timing. Glenda had been a Broadway star before signing with Warner Brothers, working as a featured player in dozens of films, usually playing a wise, cracking, tough, and resourceful gold digger. Just the kind of girl street urchin Charlie McCarthy might ask out for dancing in lemonade. Lemonade, get your dated lemonade here. Superb blend, one choice. Lemon, three gallon water, you can't miss lemonade. Say, uh, Charlie, Charlie, there's, there's a reporter waiting to interview you. Oh, no, I can't see reporters. I'm too busy. Bergen hand, hand is tired now from signing my autograph. <laughs> Say, look, uh, Charlie, would it make any difference if I told uh, you that this reporter was a charming young lady with no, lovely I, blonde hair? I can't. What? Is she? Oh. Well, I, you should say those things, Amici. Remember, never keep the reporter waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, this is Miss Glenda Farrell, the screen's ace newspaper woman, known to press and public as Torchy Blaine. Oh, boy, is she a knockout. I'm carrying a torch for Torchy. Mm. <laughs> Hello, Mr. McCarthy. Now, all I want is the story of your life. Well, I haven't lived it yet, but I'll... Oh, <laughs> now, don't be so modest. Uh -huh. From all the reports I get, you've done quite all right for a young man. Well, I've had my moments, yes. <laughs> you know, you have lovely eyes, Miss Farrell, Miss Blaine, a torchy, a cutie pie. Uh, <laughs> hold on there now, McCarthy. Don't count on adding me to your list. Where were you born, Mr. McCarthy? Well, I was born... Oh, I see. Hard-boiled newspaper name, huh? Were you born, Charlie, or did you sprout from the soil? Well, you've been talking to fields again, huh? <laughs> Well, Mr. McCarthy, can I quote you as saying that Dorothy Lamore is your big moment? She was up to now, yes. Oh, <laughs> come, come. Let's not mix love and business. All right, let's drop the business then, huh? <laughs> now, listen, Playboy McCarthy, I've met your kind before. Yes. Just because I'm a girl reporter, what makes you think you could make love to me? Well, I don't know. I read so much about freedom of the press, I didn't mm. know. <laughs> That man who said something like that to me kept a raw steak over one eye for a week. Oh, strike me black. Mm. Are you a boxing reporter? <laughs> no, but I can arrange to have your ears boxed if you get too fresh. You'd do that to me? I wouldn't hesitate. Now, Bergen, you stop putting those words in my mouth. I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, looks like this is going to be just an interview, huh? Yes, yes, oh. doesn't it? Oh. Is monkey business your only business? Well, no. I really have, uh, have a big lemonade business here. I'm a magnet. I have a corner on a lemonade stand, on a corner on a stand on a lemonade. Oh, why, Charlie, why didn't you tell me that before? Well, yeah. You're a big lemonade magnet, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just love big businessmen. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, let's stick to the interview here now. Do you want to know where I was born? No, no, I don't care oh. about that, really. Does your lemonade business run into big profits? Well, I should... Uh, is this for a publication? Mm. No, no, this is just between us. Yeah, oh, I see. Well, we do anywhere from uh, 400 and 400 dollars. <laughs> Really go as high as one of the... Oh, all of that. Yes, yes, indeed. And with a good bookkeeping, I can run it even a little higher. <laughs> oh, that's marvelous, Charlie. Yes, indeed. When, uh, when do we go to Atlantic City, huh? Uh, Atlantic City. Now, wait a minute here. Now, now, now. Now, look, I don't need more than 10 or 12 new gowns and a small Rolls Royce. Not the big one, a small oh, one. Oh, sure. And, and a diamond bracelet oh, or two. Oh. Not the big stone. Yeah, Ten, 20 carats. Sure. It'll be all right. Yeah, sure, okay. you, uh, you don't mind if I ask for a few little crinkles no, like that? No, do I don't yourself? mind if you ask. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd like to have a yacht, too. Why not? Well, no, the yacht's out, no. You might fall overboard. Oh, Charlie, how could I possibly fall overboard? Well, I could push you. <laughs> yes, you could, but uh, I could push a little myself. Uh, remember, I float now. Oh. <laughs> oh, I can just picture it, Charlie. We two together. Yes, yes. Oh, aren't we going to have fun? Well, yes. Now, wait a minute now. Now, just a moment here. Why, why, what are you trying to make out of this? Now, I'll tell you why. Why don't you have Bergen? Why don't you take have him take you out? Now, there's a man of wealth. Bergen? Uh-huh. Bergen has money? Oh. oh. He's the ideal boyfriend, I'm oh, telling you. Oh, he is. Mm-hmm. You think he'd be all right for me, huh? Yes, yes. He, oh, he has money, a swimming pool, townhouse, badminton court, and all that stuff. Well, that's wonderful. Confidential. Well, if I can't have you, then that's, uh, that's something to think about. Yeah, it's not much, but it's something. Yeah. <laughs> so, Bergen has money. Oh, scat, That's scat. very interesting. Mm. Oh. By the way, Charlie, what does Bergen do to make his money? Well, I don't know. All I do is sit on his knee, that's all. Move over, Charlie. <laughs> Betty Davis had only a handful of films on her resume when she flirted with Charlie McCarthy on September 12, 1937. But Betty was already an important movie star. Betty Davis had already won her first Best Actress Oscar. Critics and the public alike were always very enthusiastic about her films and her performances. And Charlie never passed up an opportunity to chat up a beautiful young starlet. And as you will see, Charlie does quite well with a young Betty Davis. Betty, Betty, I am ready. When I see you, I must Betty. <laughs> now remember, Charlie, behave yourself. Miss Davis is a dignified young lady and a fine actress. Do you take me for a cad? Do you, do you regard me as a bounder? Well, I remember what you've done in the past. Put your mind at rest, Thurgan. I shall treat Miss Davis with the respect that one great artist gives another. <laughs> Is that a promise? A word of honor, old chap. Yes, very well, then. Yes. Uh, Miss Davis? Yes, Mr. Bergen? Uh, Charlie admires your work greatly and wants to meet you. And I've always wanted to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, well, welcome, Miss Davis. Welcome, indeed. Thrice welcome. You overwhelm me, Mr. McCarthy. That's not a bad idea. Now, Charlie. No. <laughs> I was carried away, Bergen. Carried away. Mm. No offense, Miss Davis. Well, no offense, Mr. McCarthy. All right. And, Miss Davis, your performance tonight was no less than superb. Are you scattering to all the girls you meet, Mr. McCarthy? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> girls may come and girls may go, but Davis is ever in my heart. <laughs> You're very kind, Mr. McCarthy. <laughs> Nothing, have <really. laughs> Miss Davis, I simply adored your picture. I sit on Bergen's knee, but I worship at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> you touch me deeply, Mr. McCarthy. And may I add that I have found your antics constantly amusing? Compared to your art, I am only a buffoon. A thing of rags and tatas. Yes, but under your mask, I am sure something deeper lies. Oh, lies and lies and lies and lies. <laughs> you know, you have a, a certain pathos, the spirit of Pagliacci. You mean Pagliacci wants a cracker? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't you know, do those things. <laughs> With your acting, you should go far, Mr. McCarthy. Oh, thank you. The farther, the better. Oh, fa- hmm? <laughs> How far can I go, Miss Davis? <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Your promise. Yes. 
No offense, Miss Davis. Oh, no offense, Mr. McCarthy. No. Uh, what would you say, Miss Davis, if I told you I thought you were a honey? Charlie. Uh, I won't say it, Bergen. I promise you. I promise. All right. Frankly, I'd like it, Mr. McCarthy. Mm-hmm. If you hadn't promised Bergen. I might ask you to meet me at luncheon tomorrow, Miss Davis, if I was allowed to say it, but you know how it is. Mm. <laughs> I'd be glad to go. If you hadn't promised Bergen. Yes. You know, I'd ask you for a date tonight if I hadn't promised Bergen. No, 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 that, Charlie. All right. Scram, Bergen, will you scram? <laughs> I have a little hideaway in the hills, Becky. I'd take you there and so forth and so forth and so forth and so forth. And I'd be glad to go and ditto and ditto and ditto. <laughs> Charlie, remember. Oh, will you scram, Bergen? And under the stars, Betty, I would tell you how wonderful you are. If, if I you hadn't, hadn't promised, promised Bergen yet. Yeah. <laughs> Now, remember, Charlie, oh, Scram, Bergen. Miss Davis, I really ought to warn you. Scram, Bergen. <laughs> May West was a daring choice of guest star for Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. A large part of the country, the so-called moral Christians, opposed Mae West and what she represented. Sex for fun. Sex outside the bonds of marriage. Sex where the woman is the aggressor. Oh, immorality and anarchy. Mae West built her career on her sexuality and the notoriety that came with such frank earthiness. A vaudeville veteran turned playwright, Mae West wrote socially conscious melodramatic comedies for herself to star in. Her plays were meant to titillate with titles such as Sex, intended to cause controversy and sell tickets. The condemnations from the pulpit, resulting raids, and occasional night in jail only guaranteed brisk ticket sales. Fame brought Mae West to Hollywood and she was now a successful movie star, screenwriter, Oscar nominee when she stopped by to trade double entendres with Charlie McCarthy on December 12, 1937. Ladies and gentlemen, at last the long-awaited meeting of Siren Mae West and Casanova Charles McCarthy has arrived. This is a romantic battle of the century, the dramatic moment that millions have been looking forward to. Tension is running high and so are the bets. The odds are Mae West 5, Charlie McCarthy 3. There's some talk that Charlie will weaken. They say no man can resist her. But there are others who feel that Charlie will vanquish the vampire. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Last minute flash. There's been a drop in the odds. Mae West 4, Charlie McCarthy 4 and a half. Let's get a word from the challenger, Charlie McCarthy. What have you got to say, Charlie? It looks like a tough fight, Mom, but I think I'll win. Why do you say it's a tough fight? Well, my opponent's in great form. <laughs> She's had lots of training. What do you think of your chance of winning? Well, I've had some great fights in the East. What do you think of West? Mighty pretty country. A mighty pretty one. <laughs> well, Charlie's never been in better condition. He's a fashion plate with his midnight blue full dress suit, top hat and monocle, and a blue white butterfly tie and dress shirt. Yeah, it's PK. PK tie and shirt. Yeah, shot with gravy. <laughs> <laughs> and now a word from the champion, Mae West. We've heard so much about you, Miss West. Won't you say a word? Well, all I've got to see, say is where there's smoke, there's fire. Wow. <laughs> Boy, she burns me up. <laughs> There's nothing I'd like better than the aroma of burning wood. I wonder if she means me. You better watch out, Charlie. Say, Charlie, do you smell that perfume? Yeah. Isn't it ravishing? Yes, it is. It's ravishing. It's weakening. So help me, I'm swooning. <laughs> what is it? Why, it's my favorite perfume, Ashes of Men. Uh-oh. <laughs> ashes of Men. Holy smoke. <laughs> She's not going to make a cinder out of me. <laughs> Well, Don, there's, there's been a great deal of talk, but very little action so far. Right you are, Edgar. Miss West, this is the famous Charlie McCarthy. Oh, hello, short, dark, and handsome. Hello, tall, blonde, and terrific. <laughs> Charlie, that's no way to talk to Miss West. You hardly know her. I know it, Bergen. I'm a cad. I hate myself. Oh, uh, listen, Charlie, are these your keys? Oh, thanks, May. Did I leave them in the car? No, you left them in my apartment. Oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Looks like we're going to have a white Christmas. Oh, jingle bell, jingle bell. <laughs> Charlie, where did you leave those keys? I, 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 uh, where did you leave those keys? Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm telling oh, you. I, uh, he, uh, he left them on my dresser, so what? 
Charlie, why don't you walk out on Bergen? What's holding you? Well, he is. Uh... <laughs> you better tell him, May. Well, if you want to know, he did come up to see me. Oh, he did? And what was he doing up there? Well, Charlie came up and I showed him my etchings. <laughs> And he showed me his stamp collection. Yeah. There you have it, Bergen. There you have it. Yes. So that's all there was to us. Just etchings and a stamp collection. <laughs> He's so naive. <laughs> uh, well, that's what's the matter with him. Yeah. Come here, honey. Closer so we can talk intimately. Yeah, well, well if you don't mind, I think I'd better keep my distance. Well, away. I don't like long-distance conversations, so come here. I thought you were going to have a nice long talk Tuesday night at my apartment. Where did you go when the doorbell rang? Well, I tried to hide in your clothes closet, but two guys kicked me out. <laughs> so I went out the back door. Don't tell me you went down through the you went out through the French windows. I'm on the third floor, you know. Oh, so that's what it was, the French windows, huh? I was going to say you were pretty skimpy with those back steps. <laughs> oh, you look pretty good to me, Charlie. Come here. But I thought you only liked tall men. Oh, that was my last year's model. This year I'm on a diet. Oh, so that's it. You're on a diet. Yes. Tell me, Miss West, have you ever found the one man in your life that you could really love? Yes. Sure, lots of times. Oh, I know. <laughs> could you even like Mr. Bergen? Oh, Mr. Bergen. Well, of course. He's very sweet. In fact, he's the right guy. Confidentially, you'll have to show me a man I don't like. That's well. Bergen's your man. You know, he can be had. On oh, second thought, I'm liable to take him away from you. Then what do you say? Well, if you take Bergen away, I'm speechless. <laughs> you ain't afraid I'll do you wrong. Well, now that you ask, I... Oh, uh... you're afraid I'll do you right. Well, I'm slightly confused. I need time for that one, May. <laughs> That's all right. I like a man what takes his time. <laughs> Why don't you come up uh, home with me now, honey? I'll let you play in my wood pile. Well... <laughs> I'm not feeling very well tonight. I've been so nervous lately. I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Wait, there I go. Oh. <laughs> so, good time Charlie's going to play hard to get. Well, you can't kid me. You're afraid of women. Your cancel over stuff is just a front. A false front. It's not so loud, me. Not so loud. All my girlfriends are listening. Oh, yeah, and... you're all wooden a yard long. Yeah. You weren't so nervous and backward when you came up to see me in my apartment. In fact, you did, didn't need any encouragement to kiss me. Did I do that? Oh, you certainly did. I got marks to prove it. Oh. And squitters, too. Oh, that's too much. This is too much. Yeah. Well, get this. I don't need you. I got all the gentlemen friends I want. Why, I got men for every mood. Men for every day in the week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. A good man Friday, ass and a good man Saturday. I change my men like I change my clothes. And you, you... Hey, me, me, you're not walking out on me, are you? I've got a reputation at stake. No man walks out on me. They might carry them out, but they never walk out. <laughs> I'm mad about you. I love you. I've acted like a fool. That wasn't acting. Come here. <laughs> I'll show you how to act. Oh, me, me, don't be so rough. To me, love is peace and quiet. That ain't love, that's sleep. Oh, <laughs> Cut it out, man. Cut it out. Help me, man. Omichi, help me. Oh, call on Omichi. Call Bergen. Call everybody. I don't need any help. Like most of what Mae West did, this appearance was controversial, and after this broadcast, Mae was banned from the big networks. It would be years before she worked on national radio again. But Charlie McCarthy would remain on the radio for another decade, and no beautiful guest star would be safe from his advances. So stay tuned. Future episodes will reveal more of the famous sweethearts of Charlie McCarthy. You've been listening to When Radio Ruled, Episode 26, Charlie McCarthy, Ladies' Man, 1937, starring Charlie McCarthy and guest starring Edgar Bergen, Donna Michi, Dorothy Lamour, Clark Gable, Alice Marble, Carol Lombard, Mary Boland, Mae Robson, Sonia Henney, Zazu Pitts, Bruna Castagna, Glenda Farrell, Betty Davis, and Mae West. I'm Mike Gillette, your host. Thank you for listening to these voices from the past and helping to keep these great performers and their comedy alive. When Radio Ruled is a Before TV production, copyright 2020.